So, um, thank you uh, for joining me this afternoon. My name's Tansy Barton. I'm oh, so a few more joining. <laughs> I'll get started in a minute. <laughs> So, um, so again, my name's Tansy Barton. I'm an academic librarian at a university library in London. Um, thank you for joining me this afternoon and welcome. And thank you to Anya for inviting me uh, to talk to you today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my job and our duties and my team and the library I work in. Um, and how we support our users and develop our collections and I hope you find it interesting um, and to hear about the, the kind of work we do at our library. Um, so a brief outline of what we're going to cover today. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a bit about uh, the library where I work, Senate House Library, uh, the team I'm part of and uh, what we are responsible for in the library, how the library, and then move on to tell you a bit about how the library is changing and modernising. Uh, we're quite an old institution, not as old as some, but we have uh, quite particular ways of doing things that haven't changed very much over time. Um, and then also reflect a bit on how we are dealing with the current uh, COVID-19 closures and the restrictions and how we've adapted our services to continue to provide um, access to our users during this time. And then at the end, uh, there'll be a bit of time if you have any questions or comments or want to know a bit more um, about what I've covered today or want to go into anything in more detail. Um, so let's get started now. Um, so Senate House Library, where I work, is a uh, the, uh, it's named for the building it's housed in. It's uh, part of the University of London and the Senate House, which is the image that I showed at the start, um, was built as a central administrative building uh, for the university and to house the library opening, opening originally in the late 1930s. Uh, so this picture here is one of our uh, grand reading rooms on the fourth floor, which is where the library is based. Um, we are a library that is, acts as a central resource uh, for the 17 independent colleges and uh, institutions that form the university. Uh, this includes uh, uh, institutions like University College London, King's College, uh, London School of Economics, uh, Goldsmiths, but also specialist schools at the central university, such as the Institute of English Studies. So we provide access and services to students, researchers, academics and staff, staff of those institutions. Um, we are also accessible to academics and researchers uh, in the UK and worldwide and to members of the public um, for a fee. Um, we're funded by the Central University and by the colleges to provide services to students. So unfortunately, we don't get any funding towards uh, giving services and access to the public, but we do allow them uh, to access uh, via day tickets or paid memberships. <clears throat> the library now specialises in the arts and humanities and to a lesser extent in the social sciences. Our largest and most used collections are the history and English uh, collections, but we also have collections on art, on music, on European languages and literature, uh, philosophy and psychology. Uh, we also have specialist collections on uh, Latin America and US studies, and also subjects like the ones I cover, uh, manuscript and print studies, which are uh, particularly specialist for our library. Um, our collections are quite large, as you can see here, we have over 2 million books um, and they continue to grow. Um, and as well as our main lending and reference collections and our digital collections, which is what I will be mostly talking about today, uh, we also have significant collections of rare and early printed books um, and manuscripts and archives in our special collections. Uh, material generally is designated as special, um, is generally consulted under supervised conditions uh, due to its age, value or rarity. So, moving on to our team. Um, I'm part of the Modern Collections team, which is distinct from the Special Collections team. 
um, and we are responsible for managing the library's main open access collections of lending and reference material, um, which and these collections also have counterparts in our closed access stores, in our on-site stack, and also in our two off-site stores, which in a uh, time of, of normal business deliver to our library on a daily basis. Um, we also look after our collections of e-resources and e-books and other digital resources. Uh, the team is made up of nine staff, with all we all have different specialities. Uh, there are four other librarians like me who cover particular subjects such as history, philosophy and politics um, and psychology uh, and English literatures. Uh, we have one specialist covering uh, Latin American and Commonwealth area studies. Uh, we have an e-resource librarian and a serials assistant um, and our head of department who looks after the street the strategic direction of the department and the collections. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds. Uh, for example, um, my career has mostly been built up through working through li in libraries and then going on to complete a library qualification before becoming a librarian officially. Um, and um, some of my other colleagues have come from more academic background and that's where they've built up their expertise um, to take on the role. Um, so my subject specialism is print and manuscript studies. Uh, these collections cover the history, use and production of books and manuscripts from the early Middle Ages to the present day. It is quite a specialist area, but it's something that our library is particularly known for, uh, particularly the manuscript studies or paleography collection, which is something that's considered to be of international importance. Um, but it's also a subject that's taught at the Institute of English Studies at the university and also across the other colleges as part of literature, history, um, art history, classics um, programmes. So it's quite well used and it represents a specialist resource for the whole of the University of London. <clears throat> So our teams and our roles have three main areas of responsibility. Uh, collection development, services and liaison, and outreach and engagement. I will go through all of these in more detail, um, but I thought I should also mention what we don't do as a team. Uh, for example, the library has a separate metadata team who are responsible for book processing, classification, and cataloging. So we don't really get involved in that except to work closely with our catalogers to advise on certain queries, um, like classic, to do with classification and perhaps on areas where in our collections where metadata needs to be improved. We also have a separate customer services team who run the circulation membership and first point inquiry services for all of our readers. So starting with um, collection development, So this is probably one of the largest parts of our jobs um, and involves uh, building and shaping our collections within our subject specialisms. It has two main parts, uh, namely adding books to the collection and removing them. Um, we, have, uh, we all have our own individual annual monograph budgets uh, with funds allocated to subjects. These tend to be more proportional to the size and use of the relevant collections. Uh, we're responsible for managing and spending the budget through the spending year, which runs uh, from August and roughly to May, um, which at which point we should have spent all of our budgets. Um, unfortunately, this year, our budgets were frozen um, in March uh, because of the COVID-19 situation. So um, we suspended uh, our spending activities quite early. Um, we source books a number of ways. Uh, through suggestions generated by our main suppliers based on class mark or subjects we select, uh, through academic journals and compilations of reviews and bibliographies of new publications, uh, through specialist publishers' websites, uh, and from recommendations and suggestions for purchase. We assess each title we purchase against our collection profiles, uh, its intended audience and academic credentials, its currency and relevance, and its value to our collections. We buy both print and ebooks, um, mostly new publications, but we also um, have some flexibility to buy older and antiquarian material to build up uh, the coverage of our collections. 
I also managed a number of trust funds and these are gifts that are given to the library uh, for the purpose of purchasing books for the collections. Uh, several associated with um, a named special collection. For example, one of the funds I manage is for the Harry Price Library of Magical Literature, um, which covers psychical research, parapsychology, um, magic, the paranormal, the unexplained. Um, so I'm responsible for using the income from that fund to purchase usually antiquarian material to go into the collection. Um, it's a very interesting and very unusual field. Uh, it's another area that we're known to specialise in um, and it's a very, uh, I think, exciting and enjoyable part of my job that I get to manage that fund. Um, so the other side of collection development is collection review and management. Uh, which mainly involves assessing books for rele relegation to closed access or withdrawal. This is usually based on its use, its currency and how it relates to libraries uh, and relates like, to the library's aspiration for zero growth in physical collections. So ideally for every book we have coming in, we would remove one from the shelf in its place, uh, either to go to one of our stores or ultimately to be withdrawn from the collection. Um, we do this with collection review, but we also can help balance this, balance this up by um, increasing the number of ebooks we purchase, which of course don't take up any physical space uh, in the library itself. So, uh, moving on to uh, services and liaison. One of our main areas in terms of areas of activity in terms of service is inductions at the beginning of the academic year uh, for new, new students um, and members. These usually take place from September to November and will involve groups of students on particular programmes and we give them an induction to the library covering its services, uh, the particular parts of the collection they would be interested in, in how to access e-resources, how to use the catalogue uh, and tours of the library showing them where collections are located and how they're arranged on the shelves and introduction to classification schemes if it's not part of the usual classification scheme and I'll, I'll mention a bit about how we classify things in the library in a little while. Um, we also provide instruction in areas such as specialist e-resources, um, advanced skills and using the catalogue as part of schools courses on taught degree programmes. Um, our involvement in inquiry services is currently mainly done via email or phone calls or one-to-one -one appointments with students and researchers uh, to assist them with using the collections. Uh, these, these usually involve tailored advice around the user's area of research and how they can get the most out of the library's resources. Uh, we regularly liaise with uh, academics and colleagues on issues such as collective collection development um, and how to ensure the library's collections meet research needs and over the support we're providing for students. <clears throat> An area that we're looking to develop particularly at the moment is increased research support through training sessions and more online support um, and so providing uh, specialist instruction in things like information literacy, um, how to approach a research question and how to use the library to the best advantage when you get to the level of doing um, a, an extended essay or, or a dissertation or a research project. So uh, the last main area of activity that we have is outreach and engagement. Um, this focus mainly on promoting our collections and exploring our collections, encouraging new users and also the public to access the library and to engage with us and with the collections. Um, we work with the library's engagement team who manage communications, exhibitions, uh, public events and social media in this area. We have an exhibition space in the library. Um, Um, which you can see just here. Um, so we hold in this space uh, usually two exhibitions per year um, and I have recently worked on the curation of uh, two recent exhibitions. In 2019 we had an exhibition on stage magic um, and I curated that um, and I worked with a colleague on our current exhibition uh, which marks the 150th anniversary of Charles Dickens' death. Uh, so for that, we looked at uh, Dickens' child characters 
and how they relate to um, the lived experience of childhood in the 19th century, including a lot of campaigning literature uh, from our collections which relate to improvements. Um, the campaign for improvements to children's lives through education, uh, through rescuing them from the street, uh, through housing and sanitation, um, and connecting Dickens' characters to those themes. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, the exhibition was only up for two months before the library closed, um, so a lot of it's now moved online. Um, the curation of the exhibitions usually involves uh, researching the themes of the exhibition, selecting exhibits um, and describing the items on display. A lot of it is about reflecting the strengths of our collection and promoting that. So they are often themed around areas that we specialise in. Uh, we also promote the collections through blogs and the library's social media accounts. Uh, recently, the librarians have done some blogs on e-resources to try and promote how these can be used for people's research at this time, um, particularly when they don't have access to physical libraries. Um, and another area we're involved in is attending and presenting at conferences and writing papers to promote the collections. Um, but probably my favourite aspect of kind of outreach and engagement is facilitating teaching sessions in the library. Um, for my subjects, this main concerns bringing people into contact with the actual um, objects and physicality of book history. So <clears throat> it would involve people coming in to look at medieval manuscripts, um, early printed books in Incunabula, or, or even 19th century print culture, um, and the way that relates to how people uh, read and used material um, and how that changed. Um, so those generally work by liaising with a, a tutor who um, selects material and then we will be present both to invigilate and to assist in giving background on the items and answering questions about what we are showing. Um, but it really is a very interactive and immediate way to engage users with our collections and encourage them to come back um, and investigate the special collections in particular in more depth. So moving on to the idea of modernising the library, um, as I said at the start, our library is almost 150 years old. Uh, that isn't as old as some, um, particularly some university libraries, um, but we have um, modernised in um, a very intermittent way. Uh, so we will have a long period of nothing changing and then very concentrated periods of uh, very rapid change and we're in the middle of one of those at the moment. Uh, it also means we're quite often we're behind the trend um, of library development and modernisation. Um, so one of the main ways um, <clears throat> our, uh, one of the main ways that we have been working to modernise the collections over the last few years um, is through moving increasingly from print to digital um, this is particularly rele relevant um, in the current situation as it's made us, as I'm, I'll mention a little bit more about this, it's made us much more um, capable to switch to off-site services. Um, we probably started on this much later than other libraries, but we are now around 50% of new books being purchased as e-books. Um, particularly helpful in this has been the use of a demand-driven acquisition model or DDA. This allows us to add ebooks to the collection which we select individually so we're not buying packages or um, just big um, collections of ebooks, we are still selecting them um, ourselves um, and but they're not actually purchased for the collection until a user accesses the title on our ebook platform, ebook central. So um, we have also invested a lot more in e-resources in the last few years, uh, particularly for full text and archival collections, which perhaps um, some of the other colleges that our users come from wouldn't acquire. And so we can give some added value through those. Um, one of the other big recent projects was uh, the installation of RFID tags in our open access collections. 
Again, we're probably slightly behind the trend uh, with this, but it has helped improve our automated and self-service facilities um, and should assist with stock review in the future. Um, it was um, a lot of work because uh, there are a lot of issues with our metadata, uh, with things on open access having no catalogue records at all. Um, and there's been a lot of review work come out of that because of duplicated records and various other issues. Um, but it has hopefully, it's taken us a step forward in terms of our services. Um, the big project we are in the middle of at the moment is reclassification of the library's open access collections. This is um, several hundred thousand books. Um, currently, we have several different classification schemes. Uh, most of the open access collection is in uh, Bliss classification, which is um, the version that we use is probably almost unique to us now. Um, most people moved on to the second uh, iteration of Bliss classification, which and the library did not. Um, but as well as that, we also have some collections in Dewey. We have some collections in uh, already in Library of Congress. Um, and we have some collections in in-house classification schemes as well. So we don't have one classification scheme for all of the open access material, which does affect our usability um, quite a lot. So by the modernization programme, we are going from these various classification schemes uh, to everything being in Library of Congress. Um, as well as making the collection more useful, it will mean that we will be able to buy shelf-ready books, um, which will save a lot of cost in terms of our uh, cataloguing and processing of new books. Uh, we are also already at the stage where anything, any new print books we buy come in in the um, Library of Congress. So we have a separate section for new books uh, classified by Library of Congress, um, and the rest of the collections are in their current classification schemes. Um, we were supposed to be starting the, uh, the company that's doing the reclassification was supposed to start the physical uh, movement and relabeling of stock this summer. Unfortunately, that doesn't look like it will happen uh, because of the closure of the library, but um, it's something that's going to be a huge change. And at the end of it, it will be something that we will have to do a lot of work around in terms of um, communicating and educating our readers in with the changes to the collections, uh, how they've changed physically in their layout as we'll be going from uh, collections arranged by subject to one long Library of Congress classification uh, scheme um, and how to use new classification scheme because although uh, many users may be used to Library of Congress from other libraries. They will also be used to using our library in the way it's been used historically. So it's um, a big piece of work that's coming up for us in the future. <clears throat> um, and if I just to mention stock review is a continual process. I've already mentioned um, assessing material for relegation, um, but we are in a continual process of reviewing and renewing our collections. Um, and a lot of this has been important preparation work for uh, projects like RFID installation um, and reclassification, particularly because we don't want to leave things on the shelf which um, may be withdrawn almost immediately and then we've um, got them reclassified and tagged unnecessarily. Um, so finally, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, um, a little bit about um, how we're dealing with the current situation, which I think is affecting libraries all over the world. <clears throat> um, the library closed and the university buildings closed on uh, around March 20th, and we have been working from home since then. Um, so physical access to the library has been restricted now for quite a long time. Um, but as I mentioned, our shift to digital resources has put, in, put us in a very good position to continue to provide access to a lot of material for our readers. Um, shortly uh, before the uh, closure, 
um, we uh, launched a new libguide for our e-resources, which is pictured here. Um, um, and this provides um, a much better interface for our users. Um, previously, we just had a static list which listed everything in alphabetical order, um, and it can be browsed and filtered um, and can be much updated much quicker um, than the old list. Um, and this means we've been able to add uh, resources that have been uh, made temporarily available by suppliers and publishers at the moment um, quite easily and to promote those to our users. Um, it also provides a much better interface uh, from the uh, list to the database itself. Uh, so it provides one login point and then readers can go through to the database. Um, so we've also um, been looking at new ways to reach our readers. So we introduced an online library chat through LibAnswers to our readers, uh, which provides a way for our users to talk and get an, an immediate response from a member of library staff, um, which is particularly important at the moment when we can't answer phones uh, and can't um, deal with those inquiries immediately. So it provides another way for our readers to get in touch with us uh, besides email. Um, but um, the measures we will have to take when we eventually return to the library um, to protect both our readers and our staff uh, will have a big impact on what we can offer um, and how our readers access our collections. So we don't think we will be returning or at least opening the library to readers until September at the earliest. Um, some of the uh, possible services that have been suggested include providing um, a click and collect uh, service for readers whereby they can request books from any part of the library and collect them uh, from the ground floor of the building. A big problem with access is that the library is on the fourth floor uh, going up to the seventh for readers and then to the 19th with our stack. Um, so actually getting people up to the fourth floor is going to be a big challenge when lift access may be restricted to one or two people at a time. Um, we will have reduced capacity. We're probably going to have to remove two thirds of the study spaces we have available. Um, to readers. Um, there's also measures going to be put in place to protect staff, um, which may include um, screens, gloves, uh, various bits of PPE. Um, there's considerations about how long we kind of quarantine books for when they're returned, um, the length of that, how it's managed, um, and things like that. Um, and then the big uh, issue for our team is going to be uh, inductions at the beginning of year of the year and how we change how we deliver that uh, and how it's approached. Um, so the big thing we're thinking about at the moment is most of it's going to have to be done uh, online uh, through something like Zooms but more likely through MS Teams as that's what um, our IT department is supporting. Um, and that we would have to look at recording sessions to make them available to people later on, um, thinking about what we actually do and that we're not repeating live sessions and that those recorded sessions can be made available quickly so that people can access them and we're making the best use of our time and providing the best uh, service and instruction for our readers. Um, so that's <laughs> pretty much everything I had to say. What I will do now is um, unmute people, hopefully, um, and if you have any questions, let me know.
Um, yeah, so uh, I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, if you'd like me to cover anything that I've mentioned in more detail, please just say. Okay. Um, well, if there are no questions, I hope you have found that interesting. Um, uh, you can find my contact details on our library uh, homepage, which I should probably include a link to, but I haven't. I can probably do that now. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about the library or you have any questions about the kind of work we do, um, uh, so um, anyone um, can, uh, this question, can a foreigner use any services of the library? So I said we're open to uh, international uh, researchers and academics, they can get free access to library. Um, but as I said, for anyone who doesn't have an academic affiliation, we offer paid memberships um, and to access that, we just ask that people bring uh, proof of address, proof of ID, um, and um, that way they can join the library. At the moment, it's a little bit different. At the moment, we're only able to register uh, remotely um, users who are members of a University of London College um, or a student at one of the colleges um, because um, it's to do with uh, access to our remote resources and our licensing agreements. Um, so, but the physical library itself, when we reopen, we are open to anyone, but there's different types of memberships that we offer. And I'll just show you now, this is the um, URL for the library website. I think that should go. So I think I've just crashed Zoom. 